heart rate there. Okay, so um, retrospective. So yesterday had um, uh, a diversity of material um, with the, the case study, um, with uh, material on this interface between data and models, with incubator work, um, and the Java tutorial. Um, I want to, though, in these remarks, comment a little bit on this interface between, or this meeting between, on the one hand, uh, dynamic modeling, in this case, agent-based modeling, hybrids, and data. Um, in this day and age um, where data-driven science has captured much imagination, and where uh, we are increasingly surrounded by, within the health sphere, um, novel sources of data that matches the notions of big, big data in the sense that it has, it offers the four Vs. It's high volume, the big, big data. It's high velocity, coming in often quite quickly compared to traditional measurements often many times a day, sometimes many times an hour, not infrequently, you know, uh, even more than that. Um, it has high variety, often a given measurement, say data from a smartphone can pick up, you know, location and incoming the presence or, or absence of incoming calls and calls calls out, it can capture aspects of physical activity through accelerometers, step counts. It can capture screen time through when the screen's enabled, um, as well as things like um, uh, gyroscope movements and, um, and uh, in some cases, even uh, contacts, uh, contacts with defined beacons. Um, social media, we have a variety of types of information that can be elicited from that. Um, uh, from data coming in from wearable devices, many others. Um, we're surrounded by, by aspects of big data and increasingly our methods, our method for securing insight from the world are, are, are taking advantage of that big data, not in isolation, not to the exclusion of traditional data sources, but together with them. And complex systems methods have a unique role to play in this space. Dynamic modeling has a unique role to play in this space. And that role is multifaceted. Um, as cacophony of different data sources um, is, is increasingly um, you know, uh, growing um, and increasing in it. In, um, it, it's an imperative to understand such data, not on a on a case by case basis of each separate source being a solitude, being some sort of unique, defined, you know, type of data that is analyzed in isolation, but to recognize that they speak about an underlying situation, an evolving underlying situation and set of contexts in common, and they give different perspectives or views on that. They, they're, they offer different, you know, distorted sort of uh, renderings of this underlying situation. Um, and, and that perspective, which is key for securing insights um, from this data worthy of its name, um, is very closely linked with the system science perspective. So is the recognition that this is data over time. The very concept of high velocity suggests dynamics, change over time, you know, concern of, of the temporal behavior. And, and of course, that's the sphere of, of dynamic modeling. The data also increasingly is at a level of resolution where we, we actually can recognize particular 
generative pathways with it. So with wearables, we might measure sedentary behavior uh, as well as moderate and vigorous physical activity. Um, and we might distinguish them um, uh, and have data that, that buttresses that, that difference. Once you couple that with, with Bluetooth-based uh, connections, PPS, you can start to get a sense of the social and physical surrounds of an individual. Um, and, and once you combine it with, with aspects associated with heart rate or heart rate variability, et cetera, you start to give, give even a, a, an opportunity to peer into things like stress responses, et cetera. This data is increasingly at a resolution um, and is, or is moving towards a resolution that allows us to, to kind of resolve or tease out or recognize different causal pathways, or at least have a much better read on them than if we were doing a once a year you know, health survey or even every month and we were asking for people's retrospectives. We've known for decades since the NHANES 3 study in, in the US, the National Health and, and Nutrition Examination Study, or, or, or um, since a variety of, of more specialized instruments that people self-report for things like nutritional intake, uh, for things like physical activity, for things such as weight, um, uh, often have real challenges data-wise associated. There's uh, different types of bias, sometimes based on normative concerns, this particularly is true um, in, in the weight area, for example, but also in nutrition um, and, and in physical activity. And we've known that physical measurements of these things, such as uh, with actigraph accelerometers in the earlier generation, offer actually more grounded measurements of these factors. Um, and, you know, collectively, what we have is a growing set of data that can start to, to lend resolution to different causal mechanisms, different pathways to, to effect. And we need tools, analytics that are worthy of this data. We need ways of, of rendering that cacophony of data, cacophony of numbers into insights about salient features of the situation. And the data relates to context, Often it relates to mechanism, and often it relates to outcome. But we need analytics that can speak to those areas. And agent-based modeling, and more broadly, dynamic modeling, fit in here very, very well to try to make sense of that evidence. This interface between models and data um, is the deep one and, and never has it been more urgent um, or more important to think through, you know, what are the opportunities there? Um, and the truth is that science is, is a, you know, human sphere and different communities pursue often the big data side of analysis and the dynamic modeling side of analysis and the machine learning side. And, and as someone who crosses over those areas, um, I can tell you that the opportunities are huge for, for bringing together these methods. And even if we just confine ourselves, we put aside the machine learning um, for the time being, and we confine ourselves to dynamic modeling and big data, Agent-based models offer a particularly rich place to start thinking about how to best make sense of data and uh, to best understand it, to best relate to it. Something I didn't talk about yesterday, I, I mentioned a, a good you know, um, handful of methods that models come together with data. Talk about parameterization, calibration, filtering, you know, uh, direct parameterization versus kind of parameterization assisted by logical reasoning or, or some simple assumptions. Um, and those are all good, but I, I didn't mention that with agent based models, 
sometimes this term parameterization is actually itself involving some of these factors we've just been discussing, like big data. So we have agent-based models, for example, where people's mobility patterns in the model are given by smartphone collected location for a set of participants. And we track, okay, if that's where they are at the time, what would the implication be for transmission of infection, for example, or transmission of norms? We layer on that data of, of locations based on some grounded observations from a group, some theory about how norms might spread or or how health behaviors might be transmitted through imitative behavior or how pathogen might be transmitted and and ask okay if this is a ground if that were a grounded theory of those higher level phenomena what would it imply in terms of you know health attitudes or 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 more pathogen burden uh, across the group or what have you in other cases we've We've set in contact pattern. And these are any logic models, by, by the way, by and large. And, and we, we place data on contact patterns into them and ask, okay, what are the consequences of these for spread? It's actually a paper um, uh, that, that lays this out in, in quite some detail for plus computational biology, um, which is. Uh, far into its review process and hopefully we'll be completing and getting published shortly. Um, uh, so those are you know, some ways in which even just parameterization turns into this interface between big data and, and models. Um, we saw yesterday just you know, the tip of the iceberg here. Um, and some of you have taken my systems data science bootcamp or, or my Fields Institute systems data science course. We'll, of course, have um, additional uh, familiarity with some of these issues and, and some of the additional methods there, which can bring models and data together even more richly. But, but calibration is a key one. Calibration, as we saw yesterday, is about aligning a model's assumptions um, such that it best reproduces patterns from the world. And we saw that generally it's gonna be matching patterns from several types of data, actually many types of data. And we adjust our assumptions, which are less tightly grounded or, or fixed by our pre-existing understanding, to best reproduce that data. And that at a philosophical side uh, associated with it um, that I emphasized. Um, it had a sort of side of, of intuition, what was going on and, and concepts, and it had a side uh, associated with uh, the mechanics of it. In, in general, with optimization algorithms and in, in, in particular with any one. Um, so that was, um, you know, one way in which we align a model's assumptions with data. And I argued that it wasn't merely a way to sort of arrive at proper parameter values so we can move forward and, and get to the really good stuff. It's, it's often the nexus of real learning. And, and it's because of that that we, um, that we often you know, really dignify calibration as a, as a particularly important point in the modeling journey. We, we use it to learn, learn when our thinking is off base, learn when our thinking just doesn't add up, no matter what we think. And, and, you know, we learn about problems in the data, I argued, we learn about problems in the model, uh, we learn about problems in our mental models, um, and learn about problems in our assumptions about particular parameter values. And sometimes it leads us to accommodate, you know, parameter values that, that surprise us. And sometimes it leads us to change our structure. And sometimes just to say, okay, we're a lot more savvy about this data source. We'll, we'll really downweight it or, or, or minimize its importance. Now we are heading into an era where the 
story between models and data is particularly um, is evolving a lot. And uh, I'm involved in, at a, I've long been involved in stories which try to understand the world jointly in a really rich way between models and data. Not, not putting all our faith in a model, not putting our eggs just in that basket, but also listening to the data closely. And there's a set of methods that's founded in my course and in that boot camp, which, which lay out the opportunity for it. And the opportunities are really rich um, for sort of having a consensus view from data and modeling, where the data is cross-checking the modeling, where our understanding from the modeling is recurrently regrounded in what's observed in a way that better aligns with what's empirically observed. This is particularly key with stochastic systems because with stochastics, we don't know which way it's going to turn out. And it turns out data will often tell us, oh, you know, was no outbreak. There could have been an outbreak for the past month, but there wasn't one. So the model gets updated with that understanding. So it's always ready to go forward based on all the understanding. And those are rich techniques, but too much for us to cover here. Agent-based modeling has a particularly big opportunity for it, but some challenges with, with applying some of those techniques, such as particle filtering, particle MCMC. Um, uh, and you'll find videos to be talking about those techniques in, in detail and some comments on, on some of the challenges with agent-based models. But there's another move of FUD, which uh, Nastaran back there and Guillaume both had some, uh, some work with, which, which actually seek to deduce model structure from data. They actually seek to use data to, to clue us in more savvily for what sort of model structure would adequately account for this data. What is this telling us about our, our model structure? And there's a lot of opportunities there as well. And there's some really exciting data-driven science and engineering work being done um, to, to allow us to kind of arrive at an understanding of what model structure might be, might be needed to best explain this data. What is the data telling us about this structure? Um, with a model, we have theory and we can understand between the data and what the theory tells us, sort of the theory tells us the logic of the situation, we can figure out what the underlying situation in the world often is. If we allow the model to, to inform the theory there, often it's by you know, telling us to go back to the blackboard. It just doesn't add up. The theory just doesn't account adequately for the data. But these newer methods start to clue us in to to model structure, they start to suggest model structure. And I'm very enthusiastic about those, but I also recognize their limitations. And a key limitation here concerns causality and, and the fact that when we observe sort of characterizations that explain data in the world, they aren't always causal in, in nature. And there is a risk that we'll arrive at a description that works right now with today's data generating process, but which will be horribly off base if the underlying situation in the world changes um, or if we go to another context. The hope is to have simple enough mechanisms depicted in the model that they're conserved in, in other regions. Um, but, but, you know, this is, it's not magic. It, it, it has huge potential, but one has to recognize it. Um, and I might add that if you build up, you know, if you build up a COVID-19 model, as we did even before the pandemic started, Wade, Chaoyan, Winchell, Pinyang, others, um, we had a full stable of those models, which ended up, you know, guiding this province um, as the primary analytics guiding Yukon, 
Australian capital territory makes a big difference there for, for guiding their decision making on an ongoing basis. Um, those models initially didn't have vaccination. Vaccination wasn't, wasn't yet available. And of course, once it became available, we needed to update the models. Once variants of concern came about, we needed to update the model structure. I mean, once Omicron came on the scene, we needed to. So this whole issue of having to go back and update your theory when something in the world changes, is not unique to data-driven approaches, part of our human modeling process. But the basic gist of the story is the interface between modeling and data has never been more promising for insights. And um, now particularly dynamic modeling and agent-based modeling in particular in data have a duet that they can sing, which is really quite extraordinary. And, uh, and going forward, the opportunities will be ever greater to bring those together. Much of my personal you know, commitment and research, much of my students' work is focused on that interface of modeling and data. Because at the end of the day, I try to be a skeptical modeler and a humble model in terms of recognizing the limitations of our models and always cross-checking. And I see data as this huge opportunity uh, at, at you know, rich data is, is offering huge opportunities to keep us honest in our modeling, keep us learning, get us out of our, you know, uh, cherished prejudices about the situation, and um, and move us to deeper understanding of the world. Um, and I see theory as captured by models as equally key uh, within that area. So, you know, yesterday we just dipped our toe into this area. Calibration is kind of the bread and butter technique of bringing models together. And Kirk Kruger's presentation yesterday was built on the model Wade uh, built just phenomenally um, before he started, before the pandemic was declared um, and, uh, and built it up. And it's still this underlying foundation, this edifice on which Kurt is built, but that model um, it's using calibration on a frequent basis for a very long time. It was calibrated every two weeks, you probably heard. And um, it was just tremendous, uh, uh, you know, success in sort of keeping this model aligned with observation. And the truth is that gave the model a great deal of credibility. Um, we talked, we've talked about models as is being used in the human theater of, of, of uh, decision-making, scientific, developing scientific understanding and teams. And, and models in the relationship with data are actually very, very important to this, to, to, to build confidence in models, to help people understand models. And, and as Kurt described, this is a multifaceted story um, because many models we use, we don't look to perfection in characterizing the data. We look for it to capture the trends, the basic features of the data, the essential patterns in the data. What do we calibrate to cumulative incidents over a period rather than matching every nook and cranny of this outbreak or that outbreak? you know, within the jurisdiction. Or maybe we capture, you know, the relative burden by age um, and, and seek to, to really emphasize the differences between different ages rather than, you know, the exact numbers of the burden at a, at a given age. Um, or maybe we, we seek to characterize the periodicity of some, you know, outbreak or the frequency of some occurrence. Uh, without getting into the particulars of the data, but you know, people often encounter pub in public health, they encounter the details, they encounter the data, and they're always going to be looking back and forth to the model and wondering, is the model due confidence? Um, you know, my confidence. And there's a lot of explanation that goes on, having led that work for a year, year and a half. Um, there's a lot of confidence 
you know, building that goes on there to, to help people understand um, that that story between models and data um, is not a simplistic one. Models are not crystal balls. Models are learning tools. And that story can, can resonate with you. Um, I will, I will say also that, um, you know, Kurt alluded to it yesterday. Um, it's been alluded to in our other work that, you know, this whole issue of models as storytelling tools is, is really very important. And, and they have to tell a story that is a certain place plausibility. And so it has to align at some level with data. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, the, the power of the stories is that they, they inspire understanding that carries on beyond that circumstance. And so, you know, when you're trying to match models to data, um, doing so in a way that allows those stories to carry confidence um, is, is really important and valuable. But before we talked about calibration yesterday, we actually talked about this other process, process called sensitivity analysis. And sensitivity analysis was, was looking at a different problem. Um, like calibration, I was running the model many times, varying parameters, but, but you know, its goals are very different. Its goal was to, to see how to model outcomes in any number of different ways vary with our assumptions in the model, our structural assumptions, parameter assumptions. And we saw that within stochastic models, we could run the model and just the very presence of stochastics would lead to variability in the outcome from run to run. Some of the, sometimes it can be big variability, sometimes it can be small. It depends a lot on the particulars of the model and the outcome you're looking at, and the type of stochastics represented. Um, We also saw that there's parameter uncertainty um, that's represented. And, and we can vary parameters to reflect that uncertainty and see how big a difference it makes. This is very important, again, in the human theater of modeling, because often we want to put our emphasis in data gathering into parameters that exhibit, for which the model exhibits high variability as you modify them. So you modify them and the model outcomes, their chosen outcomes of interest change a lot. Um, so we put emphasis into there. And there's a very interesting story that I'm not gonna have time to do justice to um, between sensitivity analysis and calibration. Amongst other things, I'm gonna just throw out some, some comments on it. Amongst other things, you often have to pick artfully, particularly for an agent-based model, the set of parameters you want to calibrate. And one motivation for picking a given parameter might be that it exhibits, the model exhibits high sensitivity to it, right? Like if modifying that parameter leads the model's results to be very different, it might make sense to calibrate that, right? Because you want to, arrive at a value of it that, that will allow the model to, to best match the data. If you don't calibrate it, maybe the model's data will, model's results will be far removed from, from what similar data would suggest. So you calibrate that one because it's very sensitive to it. That makes sense. And indeed, that is often a motivation for selecting a parameter for calibration. But there are times also where you calibrate and you then go and perform sensitivity if the calibrated, because the calibrated model may have different sensitivities than did the model before calibration. There's a, there's a story there um, that's also, that's also notable. Um, those are just two methods, two, two ways in which you know, they interplay. There's actually a number of, of really interesting issues. And because of this, some observers have sought, some researchers have sought to advance methods to perform sensitivity analysis 
and calibration together in a way. And some of the systems data science methods that I cover elsewhere and thought of maybe trying to include, but there wasn't time, approximate Bayesian computation or MCC and so on. You could think of them, you could be forgiven for thinking of them as kind of having a bit of a flavor of sensitivity analysis on the one hand and calibration on the other. Um, they, they arrive at an understanding of the diversity of possible particular assumptions about parameters that would quite well match the, the observed data, that would, would account for the observed data. And you might get a bigger variety for certain parameters than for others um, uh, in terms of the sort of the of likely possibilities. Um, but I'm not going to go into that more. So it's a whole area. Um, okay, so um, I think I'll end those remarks there. But I, as always, I want to put my foremost emphasis here on dialogue with with the participants on opportunities for questions and suggestions and requests, etc. Um, so um, I'd like to you know take this opportunity to ask, are there any things that um, people would like to suggest, comment on, request more more thoughts on? Um, uh, you know, dialogue about um, here before we get started with a set of materials. Uh, Bjorn has his uh, hand up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, um, so the question for those online was um, I had made a remark yesterday that in calibration, it is possible to make use of individual level data. And uh, the question was whether I could explain how, how one would, would, would go about that or more accomplish that or what that would look like. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll comment on that. Actually, it's kind of a really nice setup for a point I, I really should have made yesterday, but um, better Nate than Lever. Um, so, so in calibration, um, we are adjusting model assumptions so the model behavior best accords with what's observed in the world. And commonly, those assumptions are assumptions about the, the their, their assumptions involving parameters that govern the model as a whole. They may have implications for agents, but but they are perhaps an assumption about model wide, you know, uh, impact of, of age on hazard rate of developing, you know, um, uh, developing some, some underlying condition or, or uh, propensity for care seeking um, among those experiencing certain types of mental health distress or, or what have you. The parameters governing the model more generally. Um, and they apply perhaps to many agents. Many agents um, then we'll calibrate the model so that it's emergent behavior. We'll adjust the value of that parameter so it's emergent behavior matches what's, what's observed empirically. Um, now, very commonly, we think about matching model outcomes, um, the results of a model, the outputs of a model against comparable data from the world. And I noted that agent-based models 
are very flexible in allowing you to take model data and summarize it or slice and dice it, stratify it, et cetera, in all sorts of different ways. And, and as such, they can be compared with a broader set of possible real world data. Um, so we might summarize model data in these age categories to compare with this data, um, but it, with respect to those age categories for that data. And there's no problem doing that because we know people's actual age. And so we can total it up in whatever divisions we want, right? Maybe we have some data that's stratified you know, one way and another you know, from the world and other data from the world that's stratified a different way. And it's no problem. Just like real world data at an individual level, you can aggregate up in any number of different ways. You can do that too. Now, when I made that comment, one of the things I was most emphasizing was that the data against which you are modeling, you are matching model data. The data from the model matching against corresponding data from the world. That data could be at an individual level in the sense that it could be things like um, it's based on pack year smoke for individual. That's so, so that's individual level longitudinal data. We may have a distribution, you know, among those, among current current, among current smokers in the population, we have some histogram, you know, for number of pack year smokers. I'm I'm pulling this out of Air, but but uh, these could be pack year smoke or something like that. Um, and what I'm saying is that that's something which um, could be smoke, smoke. To, um, <laughs> okay. Um, so this is a histogram. This is you know probability of having that many um, uh, pack year smoke for a for a current smoker, um, we could total that up in, in the histogram and compare it with a comparable histogram from the world. This is individual level metric, um, metric on that individual that takes into account their longitudinal history in a way that really is not viable for an aggregate model. You really can't sort of characterize um, this effectively for an aggregate Model. And you could do it for a number of times affected or number of times this person has previously presented for, you know, at the STI clinic for antibiotics, for STIs, or any number of different things like that. You could have longitudinal data at an individual level, you know, their vaccination history, um, the number of vaccines they've received. Um, you could compare that data from the model against corresponding data from the world. Um, these as aspects of individual history. It was that particular thing I was trying to emphasize in terms of comparing data. Now, that being said, and, and th those things, by the way, would be very, I mean, almost impossible to imagine characterizing an aggregate model. Distinguishing people, because they'd have to be in different compartments, different stocks, right? Like people by vaccination history. It's just going to be bad enough. Um, so this is very readily done in an agent-based model, in characterizing data from individual level features or individual level history and comparing against comparable data from the world. Now, there's something more, though, that your question could be interpreted as asking, which is, um, you know, could you calibrate data from individual agents against corresponding data from the world. Um, at an individual level. Um, and well, I, I, before I get to that, I, I, I just feel my characterization of this is, inad is, is not yet fully adequate. Um, because another thing we could do from the agent-based model, for example, is take data that relates 
someone's network position, say in a social network in a high school, against you know risk of of developing um, you know acute suicidal ideation or 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 depression or anxiety or something like that. Like um, we could have data from a model which characterizes this association um, over, over many individuals. And we could compare that, you know, derive the association from the model, much as that first model we built, we, uh, we, we, we explored on the first day, you may remember it had those associational graphs showing like this, this association between, you know, distance, uh, distance, to grocery store or you know fresh fruit vegetable market versus weight or something like that. I'm oversimplifying the situation, but it was something along those lines. We had several graphs. Remember that? And each person was a dot here. And we could compare that with, you know, if we had similar data from the world from a study, we could compare it against it. And that's kind of individual level data that forms these dots, and we could use them to look at associations and compare them, right? Um, now, if you're further asking, though, and this is what I was getting to, if you're further asking about, um, you know, like comparing model results for person X with data for person X, that is sometimes done. You'll sometimes have an agent-based model where person X is a real world person, like in your study cohort or something like that, you have a study cohort and you have data of person X and you have a person X represented in the model and you follow their mobility patterns and you follow their contact patterns or something. We've done studies like this, some note. And you look at their outcomes in the model and you compare it against outcomes in the world. Um, and we've done exactly that sort of thing before. And um, I, I take that back in, in terms of, we didn't look at broad health outcomes uh, that for those particular studies, because we didn't have really good data on health outcomes. So though we did have some informal data, which, which allowed us to kind of look at that. But, um, but you know, that's, that's a more specialized circumstance where you're Agents in the model actually correspond directly to real world people, and for most most agent based models, we don't we don't have that circumstance, and it's not necessarily recommended to have it, um, because uh, amongst other things, it limits limits your flexibility and generalizability, et cetera. But it, it you know it, it does exist, and it's a way if you do have comparable data from the world on risk behaviors and outcomes, you could build an agent-based model that would replicate that even on a per person basis would allow you to kind of assess what does the model think versus what, what do we see in the world? And that could build your confidence about that theory. And then you could use that theory more broadly, you know, as a agent-based modeling um, tool for, for other populations. It would be sort of like testing the theory before and, and refining it before taking it more general. And, and that is sometimes, I don't know if those are helpful comments. Um, your question reminded me of, of those, or those, those issues. Other, other comments and questions or points for dialogue? Nothing right now? Okay. So, absence.